Everything okay and uh, enjoyed the recharge. I know you had a deliverable due 15 minutes ago, but um, hopefully you still got a bit of a break during the uh, teaching break. Uh, let me kick off with some admin stuff. Um, the first one is academic integrity. I know it's unpleasant for me to raise this, but um, I'm going to say it again. Don't forget about, about academic integrity. Uh, um, for those of you who are wondering, I have not yet um, done the processing of prior assessments. So um, if you're thinking that maybe you got off the hook, you should think again because because <laughs> um, um, that's that's about to happen. Um, and anyway, so I think you all understand that I take academic integrity seriously. I just want to remind you again that that's the case. If you think you've made a mistake, then um, please do let me know. One issue that came up um, towards the end of semester, and there were some a couple of people who are really good about this um, in understanding it and, and approaching me about it, and that was that um, a very important part of academic integrity is you don't um, manipulate tests and you don't whether it be on paper or you know like a circling dots and stuff um, or in any way do anything that could be construed as cheating so that means that when you have tests and you get unit tests for example that you don't write solutions that you know are not the solution you got asked for but you think might just pass the test okay that's actually um, a real problem it's not just um, a silly thing to do it's actually a breach of academic integrity so I raised that on Piazza and a number of people quickly came to me and said they were concerned about what they'd done and that's great it's great to be aware of it um, no one's in, in big trouble about it I just want to make sure everyone understood how it worked and um, and was aware of it because if, if this because um, now that you are very very aware of it um, you'll understand that um, uh, I'll be taking that seriously and the, the last thing is uh, don't forget in the group assignment with academic integrity uh, you're beholden not just to me and the whole class but also to your group mates so um, if you do something astray there unfortunately they get dragged into it as well which is a real pain and so if you're someone who does end up getting dragged into an academic integrity thing on account of your group mate sit tight don't stress um, i've got a very good process if you're a group mate who's been um, thrown under the bus by someone who wasn't behaving well don't worry i know it's a very stressful thing to have to go through hopefully it won't happen to you um, but if it does um, don't worry i'll take care of you and um, you'll you'll be fine it's just um, an unfortunate part of being in a group uh, if someone doesn't behave well Right, which brings me on to groups. Um, there was some discussion about groups on Piazza. Um, I know you all just had to do um, another another deliverable. And um, oh, by the way, while I'm talking here, please uh, um, don't forget to, um, um, let, to you know to ask questions. If you want to ask questions about any of these things, um, please do so, and Leo will voice them for me. So if you have questions about academic integrity or questions about groups, I'll be more than happy to answer them right here, right now in the lecture. Um, but uh, so what I wanted to say about groups is uh, this takes a bit of adjusting. It's, it's, groups are always hard, even when you do group work. I mean, I, I, when I was a student, I did group work right up to the master's level. And it, it, it's, it never goes away. The difficulty of working in a group never goes away. And unfortunately, the same is true even in, real, in the real world. Once you get a job, you will have to work in groups. And sometimes the group dynamics issues are um, challenging. And if you work in a good company, like I've worked in quite a few different companies, they'll usually give you a lot of extra training on how to work in groups and how to make decisions in groups because it's not easy. Okay, so I'm not pretending it's easy. But there are a few things I want to be really clear about. One of them is that um, uh, you need to fill out your contribution statements. We'd realize that each group is randomly selected, which means there could be quite a lot of diversity in the group. Okay, and that means you're going to do different things and you contribute in different ways. And when we absolutely don't want you to write every third line of code, that would be pretty crazy and that would be very, very silly and inefficient. That's not, of course, not what we want. Uh, nor do we want you to break up tasks and say you do task one, you do task two, you, you do task three, etc. We certainly don't want that either. What we want you to do is to solve the assignment together using your skills as you can. Okay, and so that means that ultimately when you present the assignment, one of you may have done, written quite a lot more of the lines of code than someone else. That is okay. What's not okay is if you submit the assignment and all the code was written by one person. That's a big problem, okay? And that's quite different to having a mix of contributions to the code. And we totally acknowledge that people's contributions are not necessarily in lines of code. They can be in the design work and all sorts of other things, okay? So we want you to take a holistic approach. We want you to take a mature approach to it. And we want you to realize that we are actually assessing your ability to work as a group, okay? Um, and now some, some people said uh, in one of the Piazza posts that they didn't think that the, 
the random group selection was very realistic and that the, the diversity and aptitude and skills and motivations and so forth was very different in the group of uh, three randomly selected people. It's true in, in, in a university, we're not doing things exactly the way they are in the industry. However, let me tell you something. I've worked in a lot of different companies and I've worked in a lot of different research groups and worked with some of the, literally some of the best programmers in the planet I've worked with. I've, I'll give you an example, like Andrew Tridgell, for example, um, unbelievable programmer who I've worked very closely with. I've also worked with a few others. Let me tell you, you will find yourself working with someone who's 10 times better than you. This actually really does happen. There are people who are just far, far better at writing code than other people. That happens in the real world. That happens in the industry. I saw that at Google, okay? So if you think it's artificial to have people have very different um, skills, um, think again, because that happens in the real world. But also know this, being able to write really good code really, really fast is only one skill. There's a lot of other skills when you're de developing something like the assignment, okay? And so it's only one factor. Anyway, I just wanted to say that it is actually the case in the real world that there's a lot of diversity in people's aptitudes and motivations and drive, uh, and, and we need to work out how to work with that. Now, Leo, were there any questions? Did anyone have any questions um, relating to either of these topics or any other things relating to admin? Uh, not related to admin, but Ethan asked a question. Are there algebra data types in Java? So I think that's not related to... Uh, I, think, I think that... N that Maybe in Java 17. I don't know the answer. Short, an short, short, short answer is I don't know. But I, I but I believe. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I won't. I won't say anymore because I'm just going to say something silly because I'm not sure. Um, to be honest, um, although I teach Java and although I am an expert in implementing Java and have have implemented um, the insides of a lot of the virtual machines, I actually don't. Um, I'm not, I'm not a, certainly not a Java fanboy, and I'm not always up to date with the latest uh, bells and whistles that Java has to offer. So. Um, Apologies if I if I don't um, if I don't know the answer to that. Um, anyway, that, that 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 was a reasonable question. Algebraic data types in Java. Uh, Google it and see what you find. <laughs> That'd be my answer. Um, and you can share it. You can tell us what the answer was. All right. Any other questions from Leo? No, that's everything. All right. Terrific. Great. So now we get to move on to the next um, topic, which is the A1 unit. And this is really cool because we are finally, in the second half of the semester, moving into um, deeper computer science, okay? So we've moved away from all the mechanics of learning how to program in Java, and now we're lifting to the level, and, and for the rest of the semester, basically, we're doing things which I think are a lot more interesting. And the first of these is abstract data types. And we're doing this in two parts, and um, the first part we're doing is lists using an array list, and the second part is lists using a linked list, okay? So um, first of all, we're gonna talk a little bit about ADTs, then we're gonna talk about the list ADT, and then we're gonna go and implement a list two different ways. Now, one thing that I've impressed upon you many times is that one of the reasons, one of the things that a language like Java offers you is rich libraries, and by now you've gotten used to the, all the different libraries that are on offer, like JavaFX, for example. Uh, and but also just simple things um, like the um, abstract data types. And one of the things I've impressed upon you is that you use those libraries uh, when you have a language like Java or any other language which has rich libraries, you use those libraries rather than building your own. And I've asked you in class why, and you've, you've answered a number of times and said that the libraries are really well tested and, have been, and are really well tuned. It means that they're very robust and it means they're very fast. And if you go and build the thing yourself, you're very likely to introduce bugs and very, very unlikely to match the speed. That's why we use the data structures and things that are offered by the standard libraries. So then, why am I asking you to implement an array list from first principles? Or why are we doing it in class? And the answer, I hope you know the answer to this, and the answer is, if you've implemented these things as a university student, hopefully you will understand what's behind the scenes. And understanding behind the scenes is absolutely crucial to be a proficient user. If you really want to um, use a linked list or an array list, it helps enormously if you understand intimately how they're implemented. And there's no better way to do that than to actually implement it yourself. Okay, so that's why we're doing this. Even though I've told you lots of times, don't do this. We're doing it because we're learning. We're learning how to implement these things. So. Without further ado, let's move on. Um, so what are abstract data types? Abstract data types describe the behavior of a data type without specifying its implementation. Notice that? So it's describing behavior without the implementation. So um, an ADT is an abstract idea, not abstract in the Java sense of the word, but abstract in the English language sense of the word. It's an abstract idea, not a concrete um, idea. Okay, and 
the the um, the next thing is is that a container is one very general abstract data type which you can think of as a holder of objects. And I gave the silly example in class before of the truck and you have very specific ones and generic ones and so forth. A container is a holder of objects, like a bag, okay? And a list is an example of a very specific container abstract data type. And we talked about a number of other ones um, before the mid-semester break. We talked about lists, we talked about sets, and we talked about maps, okay? Lists, sets, and maps. And we're building all of those from first principles in this class. Okay, we talked about building lists two different ways, building um, uh, sets two different ways, and building maps two different ways. And we're gonna do that at two completely different implementations. Now, the abstract data type is the list, the set, on the map. The concrete implementation is an array list or a linked list, a hash set or a tree set, a hash map or a tree map. And there are, there are, there are other ones as well, but they're the ones we're doing in this class. Okay, so let me say again, an ADT, an abstract data type, is described in terms of the semantics, that's behavior, semantics means behavior. Semantics are operations that may be performed over it, not the performance or the implementation of those operations. Okay, so we're interested in how those things behave, not how they're implemented. Okay, that's what an ADT is. So the list ADT is one of those three, three uh, ADTs that we're gonna talk a lot about in this class. A list is an ADT that's container type, just like a, you know, like a bag, it's a container, you can put things into a list. Um, and it's known mathematically as a finite sequence of elements. A list has three fundamental properties. Duplicates are allowed. So if I've got a list, I could say apple, orange, apple, banana, and then if I look at that list again, I'll get apple, orange, apple, banana. And that goes to the second point, which is order is preserved. So a list has a concept of order. Okay, so it's apple, orange, apple, banana. If you say that again, it'll be apple. If you go and look at it again, it'll, it'll be in the exact same order. Okay, um, now the, uh, so I'm gonna stop my phone from giving me notifications. Sorry about that, folks. Um, and the, uh, right. Um, then you're gonna have operations on these lists like creating an empty list, adding things to a list, and um, checking whether a list is empty. Now this is by contrast, a list is co by contrast to a set. Do you remember, if you remember what a set was, sets do not allow duplicates by contrast to a list and they do not preserve order, okay? So if I had apple, orange, apple, banana with a set, it would say it contains apple, it contains orange, it contains banana, but it won't tell you that there are two apples there because a set has no concept of number and it won't tell you the order in which they were put in there, okay? So sets are very different to lists. All right, so in this class, we're going to build our own list using our own list interface. And our list interface is gonna be similar to, but simpler than the one offered by the Java Standard Library. Notice, now some of you will have forgotten everything because you've had a two week break. Um, for those of you who've forgotten, we're using generics here. That's where the little angle bracket and the T is. It's generic on the type T, okay? So we can have a list of Comp 1110 students. We can have a list of fruit. We can have a list of integers, right? Or a list of strings. We can change that type T. And then we have these different operations over it. We can add something to the list. We can get something out of the list at a particular position. So we can get the fourth element out of the list, the third element out of the list, the whatever the last element out of the list. We can find out the size of the list, that's how many things are in there. And we can remove something given a particular index. So we can remove the thing that's at the second index and um, so forth. And we can also reverse a list. So we can flip the ordering of the list. They're the operations that we're gonna support in our classes version of a list. If you go and look at the Java standard libraries, there are other operations as well. We're only gonna do these ones in our class. Now, so let's just see what these, let's just describe these semantics operationally. So what does add mean? Well, if you've got a little list there with A, B, C, and if we go and add D, the list will end up looking like that. Okay, so we add means it puts it on the end. So D gets added and it goes on the end. Now, if I say get, and I wanna get, get element number two, it'll get C because we always index of zero. So it's gonna go zero, one, two, which is C. And you can see it returns C there. Okay, and if we wanna look at the size of a list, we've got that list there, the size of that list is gonna be four because there are four elements in there. If we wanna remove something, and we say we wanna remove the thing at element two, it's gonna remove C. So we're gonna end up with a list that goes A, B, D, right? Just like that. And if we wanna reverse a list, oops, 
Oh, oh sorry, I, do, I skipped a step. Not only does it take it out, but it also returns the value. So let's just go back there. So we took out the um, element at index two, so zero, one, two, which is C. We take out C, we return C, and we can track the list. So there's the return value for C, it's over there. And um, the next one is to reverse a list. If we had that list there, A, B, D, if we reverse it, we end up with D, B, A, okay? And last of all, we have a two string operation, which um, we're going to just um, do the following. Just gonna have the, the list come out um, with spaces between the elements of the list, and we're gonna call two string on each element in the list. So that's our list in the interface, and that's the semantics we're gonna have, all right? Now, the next question is how we might implement them. Um, and before I jump to that slide, I wanna invite you all to chip into um, the comments on the chat and tell me what is the best way to implement a list, okay? I, I think I've already discussed a couple of ways you can implement it, now, and I want you to, uh, okay, let, let me be more specific. Let me say, what, uh, if we have a list that's built from arrays, I've already mentioned array lists and linked lists, can anyone say anything about the properties of these? What's good about them, what's bad about them? Array lists and linked lists, can anyone speak to the, the pluses and minus? I'll, I'll see if Leo's got anything there to say while I have to take a cup of tea. So Leo, do you have any any um, comments uh, there? Not yet. Um, Alan just also a question, but I think Joshua has answered that. So okay. Yeah, let's just wait for some responses. Oh, I got one from Joshua. A positive is that an array list can expand and contract. Yeah, an array list can expand and contract. That's a great point. Um, the the the. But can a linked list expand and contract? I think the answer to that is a rhetorical question. The answer to that is yes, a linked list can. And in fact, um, array lists are actually harder to expand and contract than linked lists. Okay? So array lists are harder to expand than linked lists. Now let me explain what an array list is for those of you who I, I guess I'm jumping ahead a little here. An array list is where you use an array to represent the list. So if we had that list there right in front of us, the A, B, C, D, we could have an array with four elements in it and have A in the zeroth one, B in the next one, and C and so forth. Right, you can see that. But now when we remove something like we do halfway down the screen there, what happens with this? Well, we just waste that space or we, or what? Well, in Java, you can't shrink an array. So what do you need to do? Well, you'd need to go and allocate a new array with three elements in it and copy all the things across to there. Otherwise, you'd be wasting that little bit of space. Okay, so that's actually a negative. Conversely, if you had that A, B, C, D like that in, sitting in an array with four elements and you want to allocate E, well, you're out of space, so what do you do? You're gonna to have to allocate another array, which is bigger, so maybe you've got one with five elements in it, five elements, and now um, you're gonna to have to copy everything over from the old array, all four of them, copy them one, one at a time into there, and then finally you get to put your E in there. So that's actually a problem with array lists, is that um, they, you can make them grow and contract, but it's clumsy, because each time you do it, you've got to allocate a new array or, um, and, and copy everything over, either a small array or a bigger, bigger array. We can amortize those costs by only doing it every 10th thing, so we can over provision a bit and make our array a bit bigger than what we really need, so we don't have to re resize it so, so quickly. And, and, and the same, we can hold off shrinking it until it's really quite small and then shrink it. So yes, that's one of the, one of the interesting properties of array lists is the resizing is quite interesting. Um, but the main property of arrays, it's very easy to look up an element. If I want to look up the, the, like the third element in the list, I just go to index two and I access it and I got it straight away. But if I want to look up the element two of a linked list, I've got to start at the front, go to the next, and go to the next, okay? So that's actually quite a bit slower, okay? Um, so, so fast lookup is a plus of arrays, but a negative is that they're slow to grow, they're hard to um, grow and contract. Linked list, on the other hand, is that they're easy to grow and, to, to grow and contract, because if I want to grow, I just add another thing to the list. If I contract, I just remove one element from the list. But to find an arbitrary element takes time. Now, if I've got, an, if I've got a list which has eight elements in it, what's better, a linked list or an array list? Probably doesn't really matter very much. But if I've got an application which needs 10 million elements, then you want to think very carefully, because each, if you have to keep walking those 10 million elements just to find one item, in the linked list, if I want to get the 900th uh, or the 900,000th 900, element for my list, I've got to walk all the way down that list before I can get it. That's going to be really bad, right? So it depends a lot on how we're going to use this thing. So that's just a little bit of an overview of the pluses and minuses of using arrays and linked lists. So with that, I'm going to move to the mini, mini quiz. There's the mini quiz. And we're going to start coding. All right, so let's go to code. 
jump to code. Now what I've done here to start with is I have started things off by, um, oops, where's my um, notes? There they are. Okay, I've started things off by creating a, um, the interface type here. So public interface list, this is our list. Notice there's also a uh, Java util one. This is the comp 1110 one. So we've created an interface interface um, called list and you can see this is just what we saw on the PowerPoint slide, okay? Now the first thing we're gonna do, we're up here in A1, the first thing we're gonna do is create two empty instances of this interface, concrete ones, one for an array list and one for a linked list. And then we're gonna test them later on and in this lecture, we're gonna start implementing both, okay? That's our plan and we we'll, may have to wait till next lecture to finish uh, the implementation of both of them, but let's, let's make a start now. So now, new Java class, I'm going to call it a array list. Um, oh, hi, Steve. Sorry yeah. to interrupt, but I think I got a question from Adrian. What's the internal representation of an array, and how does it exact, uh, how does its access work exactly? Does each index of the array get you directly to the memory address where the info in the array is stored or somehow? Yeah, great question. Um, so the question, I'll repeat it so everyone can hear. The, I think a question was from Adrian, and the question was, how are arrays implemented internally? Now, one way to answer that, Adrian, um, I, I, I won't do it right now in the lecture, but you can do this, I think if you go back to one of the very early lectures when I introduced arrays, I think you'll find that the Java Waterloo Visualizer examples will, will help you with that, because they actually illustrate the array. And But I'll, I'll cut to the chase in answering your question anyway. So, so for those of you who are wondering how arrays are implemented internally, I would recommend having a look at the Java Waterloo Visualizer. But the short answer is, the arrays are implemented in contiguous memory. So it allocates a block of memory um, and it's of the appropriate size. So say I want to implement uh, want an array of size 10 and um, they were integers. So then I'd have 10 integers in a row that would all be directly after each other. And if I wanted uh, the first one, which is index zero, then the operation to get it would simply be a direct access to the array object at offset zero. And it would grab that zero thing out. And if I wanted the third one, um, that would be offset two, it would take the address of the array and add two times the size of the, the element, which is an integer. So it would add you know, uh, 64, uh, 32 times two, which is 64, and, and it would access that memory address. That's how it works under the hood. Now, people in the class don't really need to know all the details about how it works under the hood, but the key thing is we can index into the array by doing arithmetic, not by iterating through a list, which is what we need to do for a linked list, okay? So we can just go straight into the array and grab the thing we want because we can know the offset of the array that we want. If, if you say offset, you, you say you want the um, element, the 10th element, right? then I just index into uh, index nine, right? Because we always base zero indexing. So I index into, into um, element nine and I and, and under the hood, what, what, the, what the computer does is it adds in nine times the, the size of the elements. If the elements are 32, um, so, so four bytes or whatever, it'll add nine times four to the address and just load it directly, okay? But if it's a linked list, I've got to actually traverse every one of those nine elements. I hope that makes sense. Um, but if there's, if there's more you'd like to ask, feel free to ask some more questions about that if I didn't quite get to um, where you were, what you wanted to know. All right, so anyway, um, Assuming I've answered that question adequately, I'm gonna move on now. Um, but it's a great question, by the way, because that question is at the heart of, of what we're doing here. Um, and some of, it may, some of the answer to the question may become clearer as I start, start implementing the code. But um, all right, so now we're gonna, we're gonna create an array list and it's gonna implement those methods. For the moment, we're gonna leave it empty. Okay, we're gonna leave this blank like that. Um, why is it still whining? Uh, what's happened here? Uh, it cannot access list. Why not? Oh, this is not public. Uh, it should be. What's the matter? What's going on here? Um, and my cat is harassing me. Cannot access Comp 1110 lectures A01 list. I don't see the problem here. This is interesting. One related problem. Can't access it. This is public, the list is public, public interface list, they're all public. And it's in the right package, Comp 10 lectures A01. Array list, public class array list. My goodness, what have I done wrong here? Can anyone see, can anyone see this, what this is? This seems a bit confusing. 
I see. You misspelled implement. Oh, really? Here? Implement. No, I just auto completed it. Uh, what have I done? This is an interesting case here. No one can see, no one can see what's going on here. Sharp pair of eyes, anyone? That's really strange. I don't understand what's happened here. Um, let's see. Create test. Why do I want to create a test? Make it package private. Create a subclass. Um, I don't want to do any of those things. I don't know. I don't understand this. Um, let's just see what happens if... Um, hmm. I'm going to um, quit this. I'm going to quit that and start it again. I'm very confused by that example there. Um, we're going to start that and see if we can make IntelliJ uh, happier Stanley again. Stanley just suggested you should remove the, the T at the end of the list. Oh, okay. Uh, no, um, I don't think so. Well, well, let's have a look here. We'll close this. So this is this is not the recommended way to deal with a problem, but here I am in a lecture and I've got something that I don't understand. Oh, what's this? There's a class there which I don't, shouldn't be there. Loading up A0. Well, there you go, folks. As far as I can tell, that was some bad behavior from IntelliJ. It seems to just have gone with me restarting. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Uh, apologies for that little glitch there. I have not the faintest idea why it did that. Um, but we'll... Oh, no, it's, it's come back now. What? <laughs> All right, what is it? Uh, come on, IntelliJ. What is going on here? Cannot access... Is there something... Normally when you do this, you'll get a um, something to... We need the type parameter here because um, without that, um, without that type parameter, we don't um, get to declare all these types. So this definitely needs to have a type parameter. And this one here, let's just see what happens if I exclude that. I'm pretty sure I've got to do that. Ha. Huh. This is really strange. Um, class array list must either be declared abstract or implement that. Okay, implement methods. Just see what happens here. Oh yeah, now it wants to add it without the type parameters, which is not going to work. All right, so let's just put the type parameter back. Uh, let's just try this again. This is really odd. Sorry, folks. Okay, so now it's presumably going to want us to add implement those. Uh, implement the methods, yep, and we'll say yes. So why is it still complaining? I don't know why it's complaining. This is very, very strange. Um, I'm going to keep coding in the hopes that this resolves itself or that one of us has an epiphany here, or we realize uh, what... Many people is suggesting that could be conflicting nouns because array list already exists. Yeah, sure, but that's okay. We, we can do that. It's our own array list. Um, that's okay. We can change the name of it if you want. Like, we can change this. Unless I mistyped this, right? That, that's perfectly okay. We can, we can call it... Um, that, I don't think that will be the issue. Um, uh, refactor rename. Uh, no, you're allowed to do that. Okay, we can, but we can try that. Just call it that, okay? So we call it array list X. That's not the issue. Um, and I have written this code before, so let's just, wow, this is so strange. All right, so I'm gonna try something else here. I'm gonna add, um, is that a, a zero? Yeah, it should be a zero. I just wanna make sure I've actually got the, you know, I haven't got an O instead of a zero, for example. Is that a zero? Um, yeah, it is. All right, so now let's, we'll just add a new class here, new Java class. 
um, and we'll call this one here uh, length list 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 not lost <laughs> we'll call it, we'll give it put an X there just uh, to illustrate this point here and we want to add it to git yes we do and we're going to make it um, parameterized in type T and we're going to make it implements um, link uh, sorry list comp 11 10 lectures list T okay and then we need to um, implement the missing methods implement the methods like that and it's still misbehaving oh my goodness um, this is super strange okay well for the minute I'm just gonna leave it because it's just a bit too strange for me to um, to to cope with and what we're gonna do um, is um, so we're going to rename this by the way we're going to rename it back to how it should be without the x it does not need the x that should not be an issue and you know uh, I'm going to fiercely go coding ahead we're going to do some other work um, and um, we'll take a little break in the um, maybe at, maybe at um, four o'clock and at, while you guys have a break I'll just mess with this a little and see if I can resolve it all right, I have not the faintest idea what happened here. This should not be an issue. Um, <clears throat> unless there's something right under my nose that I just can't see here. Anyway, let's keep moving. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna write some tests. So um, <clears throat> uh, what we're gonna do right is, yeah, list test. We're gonna create a class here called list test, control new Java class, and we're gonna call it list test like that. There we go. And um, it's going to have just a series of tests in it, and we're going to have a boolean at the top to say whether we're going to use the array list or the other one. So we'll say private, private, um, static, final, um, boolean array, right? So we'll just have, to have that there, and we'll just um, we'll start that with that as true, right? So we're going to use the same tests for both the array list and the linked list, all right? Um, and then we're going to uh, use, we're going to create some tests, um, test, and we're going to say, um, was it public void? Um, and, and we're going to write a test for each of the, let's split this out. Come on, IntelliJ. Uh, sorry, I use two different IDEs and I get confused about which one works which way. And I'm using a funny keyboard as well, so split, right, there we are. Okay, so now we go to uh, list test. There we are. So let's just, we'll write a test for each one of these. Test add, test add, like that. And, um, and then we'll do remove, size, get, and reverse. Okay, so at test um, public void. Um, why are we writing the test? Test, by the way, we're writing the test because we want to start off um, with test driven development test um, remove like this um, and um, test get and test reverse so I want you to be thinking now um, on the chat about what I should be testing for in each of these cases. What's a good way to test addition? What's a good way to test removal? What are some basic cases I should be testing for? So I want you to start um, typing them in and, and um, Leo can uh, yell them out to me and we'll start, we'll try and write tests to cover the cases that you can think of. There's a very good practice to think of um, um, how we might test these. I'll give you an example. Um, so for a test reverse, we should write a test that reverses twice, right? Because if you reverse twice, it should come back to where it started, right? So if you start off with some list, reverse it, you'll get a different list, and then you reverse it again, it should be exactly the same as the one you started with. So I'll just write that in there. Twice. <laughs> okay, um, and if you think of other ones, I'll write them in as comments, and then, then we'll start adding them in, okay? So now let's start writing out um, our tests, and we'll say, um, 
we'll, we're gonna do it in terms of strings. So we'll make strings be the type string, um, list string L equals, and then depending whether it's the, we're using arrays or not, we'll either create an array list or a linked list, okay? So we'll say array, um, so if it's we're doing that, we want to create an array list, new array list. Not Java Util. We don't want that one. We want our own one. So let's get rid of that. It should be calling our own one. Okay. Or we'll make a linked list. Else, um, new linked list. Not Java Util. Hello, uh, Steve. We got a response from a student. Um, Joshua said we should test against empty list. And uh, Stanley said uh, removing something out of the index range and not changing the list and see if there's any error. Um, and Shazen. Hang on, hang on, I'll just type this in just one second. So remove outside of the outside of index range. Yep, that's one. Yeah. And what was the one before and, that? Uh, the first one is testing against empty list. Um, I guess all of them can, right? Or what? Uh, for this is for remove or what? Test against. Uh, Empty list. Yeah. And you can probably do the same here. You can probably just do that against most of them, right? A yeah. Empty list test will probably work for most. Um, yeah, actually, Josh is saying we should do empty list tests um, for everything. And what, one of the things is that um, that soon we're going to do look, work at how to test for error handling. Okay? If you think about it, testing for error handling is a little bit interesting, a little bit unobvious. Today's lecture, we're not going to do that, okay? In the next lecture, we're going to introduce exceptions. And when I do that, I'm going to show you how um, JUnit allows us to test whether the correct exception is handled. And, um, and we can do that. So we, what we'll do, so in, in these tests here that we're writing right now, we won't write any error generating tests, okay? Empty test is fine. Empty list is fine, but we won't write any in error generating ones like test outside the range. That's a great idea, but we should um, we won't be able to um, do that this week because we don't know how. I haven't taught you yet how to how to handle that. Okay. Uh, any others? Were, were there others, Leo? So I've got um, empty list, and I've got um, index range, and I've got reverse yeah, twice. Um, Harrison suggests we should add and remove um, the same list. Add and remove the same list. We're only adding and removing elements, though. I don't quite understand that one. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, just say uh, we should add and remove returns to the same list. Oh, if we do an add and then remove, then we should get the same list back. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I think that's what he meant here. Oops. Yep. And another idea from Adam is uh, we can check the length of the uh, list yep. of uh, adding some elements into it. And we can do the same for uh, removal too. Check length. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I'll check the length. These are great suggestions, folks. This is exactly what I was hoping you'd do. All right, so now let's write a few quick tests. Um, and. Once I get to the end of this, writing these tests, then at that point, I think we'll take a break, let you guys get a, a drink if you want one. I'm gonna get another sip of tea right now. Uh, let you guys get a drink if you want one, and then I'll try and work out what the heck's gone wrong with my, uh, my code over here with a mysterious error message. All right, and then we'll move on with the rest of the lecture. So let's start, let me say, um, we'll start off with this length suggestion that I think was Adam or someone, someone just suggested. So assert true. Assert true um, L dot oops L dot size um, equals zero, right? So it should be zero at the start, right? And then we've got to include this um, method. Okay, so we assert true that the size is zero at the beginning, and then we can add um, a letter. Oh, by the way, there's some assumptions here. Um, we're implicitly testing size here. We don't have a test for size. So this code implicitly tests size. We assume size works and two string. We're going to work with strings. So if two strings broken or size is broken, then this stuff's all not going to work. Okay, so we're going to say L dot add, and then we're going to add um, a string, which is going to be the, the character A. And then what we can do is we can just test that um, 
Uh, after we've added that, the, um, the size now should be one. And we can also say assert, um, is it equal? Um, equals, and then we can say um, the expected and actual, the expected, oops, come on. Oh, come on, my laptop's really slow. We expect to get an A from the um, thing and the actual will be L.toString. Right, so if we call L.toString, we should get just the letter A, right? Um, and then, um, right, so assert equals. Now what we can do is we can repeat this stuff here. And so we'll add, the, add BB like that if you want. And now what we should do is we should get A followed by BB, right? And the length should be two now, right? And we do the same thing over with three. Right, so these are not particularly great tests, but um, you can see here we're testing a few different things. We're testing that our size method is correct, that our addition is correct, and our two-string method is correct. If any of those break, these tests won't work, okay? Um, now, let's do the remove. What we can do is we can just do these ads. You can start off with this stuff. Um, add that, then add that. Hey, Steve, yep. Can I ask a question? Could you please uh, explain the meaning of assert true? He didn't quite get that. Uh, assert true is one of the different, there are lots of different kinds of assertions we can do um, here. You can see up here, these uh, import statements here. These are different tests that we can do um, with JUnit. And assert true is saying, is where we pass a Boolean, where we want that Boolean to return true or false. And equals is when we have two objects, we want them to be equal, okay? And there's a whole bunch of them. You, if, you, if you look inside um, this package, you'll find there's all different types. Um, and it's better if you can, you can mo write most of these tests by writing yourself a big Boolean expression and passing that Boolean and say assert true. You can just do everything that way if you wanted to, but it's actually nicer and it prints a nicer error message if you say, I want this thing to equal that thing. Uh, if that's exactly what you want. Here I've got primitive values, so I'm not doing that. I could have done that, I suppose. I think I can just do that. Yeah, I can. I could do the equals here as well. I, I did that out of habit. I didn't have a good reason for that. That's a good, good point. Um, I don't know if that was the point you're trying to make, um, Joshua, but um, I could have done this, if that's what you mean. Right, so I could have used equals for each one of these. So you should only really use true when you've actually got a Boolean. Um, um, now, I've created a Boolean by writing the comparison, but it's better off, you're better off to actually do this, um, write the code this way, because one nice thing about this is that basically JUnit knows more about what you're actually trying to do, so the error message comes out nicer. And it'll say, hey, I thought you were going to give me um, a zero, but you, you, oh, and I've written it back to front, by the way. Notice that? The actual, I've written the actual zero, and it should be like this. Expected is zero. Like that, I've written them all back to front, which again, very important point. You get that wrong, and that happened one or two times of that with your assignments, and we had to fix the, the tests. If you get these the wrong way around, it can be horribly confusing because you'll get the error message when it gives you its lovely message, it tells you the exact opposite of what it means. Um, so, um, so it is important to get the um, size here. Okay, like that. Held that size, and then. Um, Three. All right, like that. So those things that I had before were also legal, they're just less clear. All right, now let's get on with this. Um, I hope, hopefully I answered Joshua's question there. So now what we're gonna do is add these ones. So now what we expect to see is this. In fact, we can write all this stuff here because that should be true. We've just created it, this is not very interesting. Now what we wanna do is having created the thing, we wanna start removing things, right? So, um, uh, so we can say like this, we can say l.remove um, and then, then you have to say which element you're going to remove. So we can, we can remove um, whatever we want. We can remove element number one, which will get rid of the Bs, right? And so then we can say this. Um, by the way, please, if I forget any of the things that you suggested, right? So that's what we should get after we remove the, the element number one. And then we can remove element number one again, which would get trim off the, the last thing. Remove element one, and then expected size will be one, and you should get rid of that guy, 
right? And we should get that. And then um, we could also remove the last one, I suppose. And that, that time we can't say element one. And if we had already, if I had already taught you how to test for error handling, we could have had a bad value here and tested that it handled the error correctly. But at the moment, I haven't taught you how to do that. So we're not gonna do that today. Um, and then what we expect is an empty string, right? Um, if there's nothing in there. And is that enough? What, is there anything else I missed? Index range, we'll do that later. Um, add followed by remove the same element. Okay, let's just pop that in there. Um, I can just do that, do that here, I guess. Um, let's do this and then um, remove that element, which is the last one. I'm just, what I'm trying to do right now is implement the suggestion that, that someone made. So this will be element number three, index three, right? So zero, one, two, and three will be that A. And once I've done that, it should come back like this, right? It should be exactly back where we were, right? Because we've added and removed the same element. That was what the suggestion was. Okay, and then after that, we start removing the things. Okay, so that there does this. Um, I'll copy that. I'll cut and paste that down here. Where is it? Um, there. The add followed by remove the same element. Test against an empty list. Um, well, we can't remove from an empty list because that would generate an error and we don't have handling for errors at the moment, but we'll leave that one there. So we'll put later for that and check length. We've done that in every single case later there. And now let's go to get, test get. Let's just do something like this again. I'll just cut and paste this code like that. Um, and again, we have to do this one later because it's error generating. Um, um, but what we can do is do some other gets, just make sure it can get the different elements that we expect, right? So, um, so we can say the size is three, that it looks like that. And if we get um, assert um, equals, um, we, if we ask for um, the expected will be um, BB if we ask for one, L, L dot get, get one. Uh, in fact, we can just do this systematically for each element, right? So we can say for zero, it's gonna be A, and for B, it's gonna be one. Um, and for, sorry, like this, two and zero. Okay, so that will have checked each one of the elements in there. And again, we're not handling errors. Um, and then we can do the reverse and we can again pack, cut and paste the same code. So we create ourselves this very simple little list. And, um, and then we can uh, put those tests in there. So it should, that all should work. And then what we want to do now is we could just do L.reverse and then call that twice, right? Um, L dot reverse, L dot reverse, um, and then it should be all the same. Okay, that looked good. Um, and then we can do something else. We can remove something, I guess, and make sure. Um, one of the things you notice that when we're, at the moment we're reversing an odd number, we should make we should take one of them out, and so we're reversing an even number as well. So we'll just remove one. So we'll say um, L dot remove, um, and then we'll remove um, element, but it doesn't really matter which one, we'll just remove that one. And then we'll test, we'll ensure that it equals A, um, like this, it should be that size, and it should be that, all right? And then what we can do is we can, um, now we'll reverse it, L dot reverse, like that, and now it should be the same size and these two elements should just be in the opposite order, right? Like that, and that should be BBA, like that. And um, then we can reverse it again and we should come back to where we were. Right, is that right? So, yep, that looks good to me. And then what we can do is we can remove another element, so now we're down to a single element list. 
Um, so we'll remove that one. And then um, we should find that um, we get a list of size one uh, with A as its only element, like that. And then if we reverse that, we should get the same thing, right? It should just give us the same thing back again. Okay, any other tests anyone would like me to do? Uh, Aiden suggested, uh, shouldn't you uh, also check the size of the list doesn't change after you do the test get? Oh, that's a good idea. Sure. Right, we can put that um, here. Okay, good suggestion. Any others? All right. Now, hopefully you learned a few lessons here, um, including that um, if we get this ordering wrong, the error message come out ugly. Now, what I'm going to do is let everyone take a five minute break. So we'll, we'll join back at f about five minutes of the hour. And while you're doing that break, I'm going to sit here and debug this and try and work out what the heck's happened um, with this code. All right. So please feel free to take a break and I'm going to try and work out what's going on with this strange code here. Ah, interesting. Steve, yep. do you want to just compile the, compile the code and see if there's any error message in the, in the, in the, in the output? Yeah, the just, just, a, just a moment. Yeah, I'll just get rid of these two here. I'll just delete them both. Oh, I see. Just compile it. Yeah, 
Um, if it can compile, then we can confirm that it's a... Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, um, where is the comp uh, build? I don't normally compile it directly from here. Um, build, recompile, pro rebuild project. Ah, here we go. There's, um, well, this is the problem. I can't resolve it for some reason, which is really strange. Um, build completed successfully. Oh my goodness, that's very strange. All right, so IntelliJ identified some issues, but the compiler said it's okay. Everything's fine. <laughs> that seems to be the case. I'm going to quit IntelliJ. This is quite odd. You see, the compiler does seem to compile it fine. Yeah. That's very strange. Um, that was a good suggestion. Um, but, but I think somehow IntelliJ can't recognize the list. <sighs> yeah, there you go. It compiled it. That's very strange. Okay. How strange is that? Um, <laughs> yeah, and then Adam in the chat saying IntelliJ is being too intelligent. <laughs> All right, I'm going to try something else then. Let's just try. This is really quite odd. I've no, it didn't happen. Can you check the language <laughs> version? Um, yeah, good, good point. Um, language lab or something like that. Uh, ch -ch -ch project. Oops. Project. All right. Uh, in the program uh, structures. I'm just going blind. Where is it? File. Uh, uh, in, yeah, in the file. In the file. Oh, there it is. Project structure. Yeah, I, I thought I was expecting to see it there. Okay, so J unit five project. Yeah, it's Java fifteen. How strange. Yeah, that's, I think that's correct configuration. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to quit IntelliJ. I didn't actually quit it before. I just closed this file, I think. So now I'm going to, I think, I can't remember if I actually quit IntelliJ. I'm going to actually completely quit it now. Um, thank you for su suggesting that idea of uh, checking whether it actually built because it looks like it did build. Very, very interesting. For those who are wondering, what I'm doing, or at least unless I've made a mistake, is completely legal. So IntelliJ should be letting me do this. And the fact that the compiler compiled it seems to suggest uh, there's a problem with IntelliJ, which is very interesting. Okay, so let's go here. See if it's gone away with a bit of a kick in the pants. I, I, I don't think it will have, to be honest with you. But one way we can, if that's the case, then we can probably solve it just by changing the name of the class. which should not be necessary. It's very annoying. Okay. Well, it doesn't have a problem now, but it did come late last time. What? It's really just gone. Okay. That's a bit sad. All right, I think let's just run our test. Oh no, it's come back now. It just took a little while to get there. Oh my goodness, this is so sad. <laughs> All right, what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna refactor this guy and refactor it and call it um, list X. Refactor. Um, Fayan just said in the chat that um, they wrote, they wrote the SAM code on their computer and it works well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I wrote this code before and it worked fine. So I'm not quite sure why this would, uh, this would do this. Okay. Yeah, that, that fixed it. <laughs> All right. Um, you shouldn't have to do what I just did then. I just changed the name from list to list X. It obviously got confused about which list. It, oh no, it's come back again now. Oh my goodness. Oh, that's because I need to change that code in our test. All right. 
Okay, all right, now I need to change all this stuff. So annoying. All right, um, uh, find and replace. Now, if you're wondering what's going on here, folks, don't worry, I think we've nearly got this fixed. Um, and once I do, I'll quickly explain to you what the heck was going on, because at the moment I'm just concentrating on getting it fixed um, without ex actually explaining to you what's happening. But the short version is, as far as we can tell, it's a bug in IntelliJ. Okay. Oh, it went and, it went and replaced those ones. Okay, that's annoying. This is so annoying. Sorry, folks. <sighs> Cannot resolve list X. I can't resolve that either. Oh, dear. That's not helping us. Um, okay. Uh, what I was going to do, just let me, let, let me just take one more step here and just do what I was going to do anyway. And that is, I will just create a new class here, new Java class, um, and I'll just call it array list. List, like that, in there. And, um, and I'll say, this, so you can try this at, at home folks, I gather some of you already are, implements. Uh, I am just say, um, you can create an entire new clean project and do the demo there. So I you didn't need to mess around with this. Yeah. Maybe, we'll just, if I need to, I'll do that. All right, so this this it seems, at the moment, this seems to have solved the problem for reasons that are totally unclear. And I'll just create list test. It just doing it in a new package seems to have fixed the problem, it would seem, which is totally crazy. Oh my, this is so horrible. All right. Um, very nearly there, folks. I think we're nearly fixed. Just bear with us. Why is, that, why is that not working? <laughs> now even this isn't working. Why is this not working now? How strange. Oh, there it is. Okay. And then we just create the linked list. Okay, and then we need, just need to implement the interface, implement the methods. Okay, now we have that. Uh, 
And we have, we get rid of that. And I think we have all of our problems solved. Now I'll just delete all this code here. Make sure I'm not deleting stuff we just spent ages writing. There it all is, okay. Just delete all this junk here. In fact, delete this entire package. Um, delete the entire thing. All right, so apologies for that, folks. What a big waste of time that was. All right, um, so now we have the code that we wrote. It all seems, IntelliJ seems happy with it. As far as we know, the issue here was simply a, um, an IntelliJ bug of some sort. Um, in fact, I'm gonna temp fate here and just change this package name to A1 and see if we're... Yep, <laughs> it seems to have worked, maybe. <laughs> all right, okay. So everything seems now to be back where it should have been. Um, yep, yeah, all right, so folks, apologies for that delay that took uh, 10 minutes. Um, I'll just quickly explain to you what happened there. Basically what happened was, um, I think IntelliJ got confused about the fact that I was using the list type here and I wasn't using the standard Java one, I was using the one in our package there. You can see it in that um, little um, context box there, it says A A01 list. Um, and for some reason it got very confused about this. But uh, with a bit of shenanigans, we fixed it. Now we're ready to pick up where we left off. Okay, so um, now what we should be able to do Go to our list test. This is what we spent a bit of time writing. We've set it up to do either array lists or linked lists, okay? And we've got, at the moment, we've got array set to true. What we can do at this point is we can go like this. We can, we can go uh, hit the control key, hit run, and we should be able to run all of our tests against the um, array list, and they should all fail, which is what we're supposed to do with test-driven development, right? We expect all the tests to fail. <clears throat> and they did, okay? But the tests are working. And you can see here, uh, it expected one and got zero and so forth. All right, so um, we're now finally ready to actually write our code. Now I really want that drink that I encourage you all to get. So now what we're gonna do is write our array list. So, um, <clears throat> and we, at the moment we've just got a little stub code here with nothing in it. So what are the, what's the basic thing? Remember, what we're gonna do is gonna have a list and we're gonna implement it using an array, using a Java array. So what are the things that this class here is gonna to have to have in it? Can anyone make suggestions? And I'll get Leo to, to relay them to me if, um, if you can make suggestions. <clears throat> Any suggestions there? Well, I'm gonna make a suggestion, just say we've gotta have the values, which is gonna be an array. There has to be an actual Java array here. So my next question to you, and, and you can um, try and respond to Leo here by um, uh, in the chat, what size should the array be? We've gotta create an array for this array list. How big should it be? Can you put your questions, your suggestions in the chat? And maybe um, you can vote, tell, um, respond to other people's um, suggestions as to whether you think they're a good ones. So how big should we make the, um, the array that we're gonna, we're gonna put here. And let me just start typing while you guys um, respond to that question. Now, we're gonna, I'm gonna do some other weird stuff here. We're gonna have an array of type T. We're gonna call it values. So this is the stuff that people are actually gonna store in this array list, okay? Values, okay? And then we have to allocate something, but here's a really annoying thing. We cannot in Java, you can in C sharp, but in Java you can't allocate an array of T. Right? You can't do it for a generic type. So what do we have to do instead? Something unpleasant. We have to um, cast something into an array of T, but what we're actually gonna allocate is an array of object, okay? Um, new array, new um, object. Oh, many people suggest to you need the initial capacity. Oh, that's a great idea. What's the right number for it? Right, very good, very good suggestion. People are suggesting I should have an initial capacity, and then the next question is what's, what's, the, what's the good um, initial capacity? So do people have suggestions for that? Uh, people say zero, four, eight, and five. Something not too big and not too small. They're great suggestions, zero, four, eight, and five. Um, I'm gonna choose something different though. <laughs> um, this, they, they, but they are really good suggestions. Um, zero is actually a really, really sensible one. Um, now, what would guide this? Well, at the moment we're testing, okay? The value we use when we're testing might be quite different to the value we use when we're building a, um, a real, and by the way, I'm gonna ask another question. You can start typing your answers while I say some more stuff. When I make the array bigger, how much bigger should I make it? 
Okay, write in the chat how much bigger you think the array should be after I make the initial array. Now, just getting back to what I was saying, is when we test this, we really want to shake it, okay? We really want to shake this thing out. So we actually want the initial size to be pretty small. Okay, so we could make it one, I guess. Um, but zero, well, we can make it zero. Let's just do that. But I probably, I was going to put two in there, but we can make it, um, we can make it, um, actually, let's just, yeah. Uh, let's just make it one, because uh, the way I was thinking of doing things is not going to work if it's actually literally zero. So how much bigger should we make it, folks? The other thing is, what else do we need apart from the values? There's something else we need here. What is it? Can anyone tell, us what, tell me what it is? How many elements are in this array? Do we just look at the size of the values to know? Well, that would be true if we resize the array for every addition and subtraction, but that's, that's expensive. So what we want to do is the values is, is generally going to be an over approximation to the size of the number of elements in the array. In which case, we need another field, which is going to tell us how many elements are actually in there, right? So we're going to say int private, private um, int um, elements, and there'll be zero to start with. All right, Leo, do people have suggestions for um, how to grow this thing? Inside, uh, make it bigger by the size of the object, and Evan suggests double the size. Right, right, uh, and so, uh, uh, so someone suggested make it by the. Uh, I think maybe they're both suggesting the same thing. That is doubling. What we can do, in fact, um, what I tend tend to do with this sort of thing is you can have a growth factor. Um, or double doesn't matter, and it could be. Um, 2.0, say, that's doubling, but let's just make it smaller. The reason we'll make it smaller is, again, because at the moment we're testing, so we want it to grow quite a lot, like have quite a few growths. You don't want that for performance, but for testing you probably do, because you want to test stuff a lot, right? So we'll start off with size 1, and then we'll have a growth factor of 1.5, and we'll need to round that up if we're going to multiply that by 1. Well, at least we need to make sure we actually grow, otherwise we get stuck at 1, won't we? All right, I had that at 2 before, which would have gone 2, 3, and so forth. Um, all right, now let's uh, write some code. We've written that. What else do I want to write? Oh, what can we fill in here straight away? Well, we can fill in the size. The size is going to be the number of elements. We know that straight away, elements. Okay, that's easy. Uh, what else did I want to do here? Oh, we do the two string. Okay, we, we need to put a two string method in here. That's really important. Why is it so important? Well, it's because our test, the way we've written the, um, uh, the tests, they depend on us being able to do two strings. We're going to create this thing and then going to turn them into strings and print them out, okay? So we need a two string method. Um, string, two string, like that. <clears throat> now we've got to create ourselves a string. And um, a simple way to do that is you say um, uh, string RTN, equal, RTN is short for return return nothing, so it's initially nothing, and then we're going to build it up. But what we want, remember what we want in those tests, we want to have the element as a string followed by a space, then the element followed by a space, but no space at the end. So how do we do that? One way to do it is we put a space before the element if it's not the first element. So if it's the first element, we just put out the element. For all other elements, we'll put out a space and then put out the element. Okay, so let's just go through all the elements in the list. How many elements are there in the list? Number of elements, not size of the array. Okay, so we're going to say for int i equals zero, um, i is less than elements, elements, i plus plus, like that. And then we're going to say, um, oops, if um, we're not the first element, so if i is greater than zero, then we'll, we'll um, return rtn concatenate on a little space. We'll put a space in front of the next element. But if it's zero, we don't want a space there, so that's why we've got that little if statement. Otherwise, you say rtn plus equals um, this element, okay, which, which is going to be values i, like that, okay? And then we can just return it. Like that. Okay, so there we are. So now we've got a get method. Oh, hang on, we don't have a get method. How do we implement the get method? That's actually pretty easy in this case. We just say um, values index. So it's super easy in an array to get, to get the value for a particular index. You just return the array element. Um, we've got size. So now let's do add. So the way we do add is pretty simple. One thing that's pretty, hopefully everyone remembers to do, you're going to have to increment the number of elements, right? So we're definitely going to do that. And then what we could do is we could say, um, <clears throat> actually you could do this. You could say this, you'd say elements plus plus, um, uh, actually, no, 
we can just say this, I think. We can say something like this. We can say um, values elements equals value, right? So when elements is zero, it will put it in the zeroth element. Um, and when elements is one, it'll put it in, um, so when we've got no, whoops, sorry, yeah, when we've got no elements yet, it will put it in index zero and then increment elements. So that's what we want, okay? But we, before we do that, we need to check to see whether or not there is actually space here, right? Because if we made this be uh, initial size be zero or something, then, um, then we'd be in trouble. So we need, always need to check whether the, there's enough space in the array. So the way we, a simple way we can do that is we can just say something like this. Say if elements equals values.length, that means we're full. Right, so if values.length, right? So if the number of elements that we've got in our data structure is equal to the size of the array, then we're full, we better grow, okay? So the way we're gonna do that is um, we, unfortunately in Java, you can't just grow an array. So what we have to do is create a new array and then um, copy everything over and then replace values with that new array. So um, we can say something like this, we can say, um, T, we basically just copy this line of code here. Just to, to be quick. Um, right, well, what, what do I, t oh, I can call it temp, I call it temp, okay, like that. And then, then what we can do here is we can say um, values or elements times growth factor. Okay, so now it's going to be, I'm going to make that into an int. We can use math.ceiling. Make sure it rounds up. Okay, so what that's going to do is going to multiply the current size of the array by how much, however much we want to grow. What's happened here? Um, we're going to make, force that to be an int. Right. To, let's make this really explicit. We'll say int new size equals, and then just grab all this stuff here. Oops, like that, okay? And the math.seal is just to make, is to make sure we round up, okay? And we've got to force this to an int. And then we'll just say, create an array of objects of new size. All right, like that. So now we've got ourselves a new array of new size. Then we have to copy all the elements over from the old array, right? So we say um, for int i equals zero, i is less than um, elements, i plus plus, and then we'll just say um, temp i equals values i, okay? So we're just copying all the elements from the old thing into temp. Once we've done that, then we can say values, values um, equals temp, right? So we're replacing um, the old array with our, the new one we just created. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Let's see if we can now pass a test. Hopefully we can pass the add test. Let's just see. So we'll run these tests and hopefully we can pass the add test. And we may be able to pass get too if we're doing, yep, and we can pass get too because what we have to do for get was to add that one line in there. So now we're passing add and get. So now let's try and do remove. Now remove is pretty simple here. All we need to do is to decrement the number of elements. Oh, we have to grab the, the thing we want to remove first. Okay, so um, t type t r t n equals values um, index. Right, so that's the thing we have to return. So they, they want us to get that thing and return it. So we're going to do that. That's one thing we have to do. Then what we're going to do is we're going to slide all the um, all, everything above that, includes that we just pull them down by one, if you follow what I'm saying. Okay, so we've got an array, we're gonna pull one out, and then everything upstream of it has to be shifted down by one. Okay, so we'll say for int i equals index, we're gonna start at index, not at, um, not at um, uh, zero. I, I is less than um, ele elements. I plus plus, and then we're gonna say values i equals, actually it's got to be less than elements minus one, doesn't it? 
like that. Values i equals values i plus 1. So we're sliding them all across, and then we'll say elements minus minus. And then finally we say return rtn. Okay, so we've um, grabbed the value that we're, we need to return first, put that aside. Then we've slid everything across, covering up the one that we just took out, and we've decremented the number of elements. Hopefully that worked. The last thing we have to do is, um, is reverse. Where are we? Yes, we've got the remove work. Okay, so, well, hang on. I keep saying it's working. We don't know it's working. What do we know, folks? All we know at the moment is our test passed, okay? And our tests, I know we spent 40 minutes writing those tests, but they're pretty pathetic, to be honest with you. Um, they're not very rigorous tests. We need to write a lot more tests to feel confident that we've actually got a correct solution. What we can say, though, is that what we've written here in class passed our test, which is pretty good. It's still pretty good, but it's not, we can't say that it's correct. We don't know it's correct. All we know is it passed the tests. So now let's do reverse. Is that all that's left? Yeah, okay, so let's do reverse now. So how do we, how do we reverse an array list? Well, it turns out that's actually pretty easy, really, if you think about it, because all we need to do is to work from the edges and flip elements like that in pairs. Now, if they're even, when you get to the middle, you'll be flipping either side of the middle. If they're odd, the middle element will just stay where it is because it's an odd array size and the middle element doesn't move. Everything moves around it, okay? So it's actually pretty simple. So we just go um, through the array, flipping the, um, the, the low order one with a high order one. So that turns out to be pretty simple to do. So let's just write that. So for int i equals zero, i is less than half of the elements and we'll round down this time. So we'll say elements um, divide by two, right? i plus plus. So that will, elements integer division by two will round it down. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say um, um, temp, uh, t temp, so we've got a variable called temp, which is of type t, equals um, values um, i, that's the one that's gonna get stomped on. We're gonna put something on top there, but we've gotta remember it before it gets stomped on. And then we're gonna say values i equals values and then we go from the back end of the array. So now we're gonna say elements minus whatever i is. So we're slowly moving from zero upwards and from the end downwards, okay? So we say elements uh, elements minus one, because remember we index from zero, which means that elements is off the end of the array. Elements minus one is the last one. So elements minus one, put that in parentheses just to be really clear what we're doing here. Elements minus one minus i. Okay, so if i was zero, we'd be swapping the zeroth element with the elements minus one element, which is what we want, right? We do that, and then finally we say this one is equal to temp, because we're, we're doing a swap, right? Equals TMP. All right, and it doesn't change the number of elements, so that should just work, right? Let's just run it. All right, fantastic. So we've passed all the tests. Remember, it doesn't mean we've got a correct solution. All it means is we've got a solution that passed the tests. With that, we're ready to move on. Sorry about that horrible problem we ran into with IntelliJ. It looks like we've cleared it all up by magic, just by restarting IntelliJ and moving a few things around. Um, <clears throat> let's go back to our slides now. We're on to the next part, which is implementing, the link, implementing things in terms of a linked list. All right, um, <clears throat> so we talked before about the advantages of arrays, fast lookup of any element. Uh, let's quickly look at that code again so you can see what I'm talking about. Look, that's how you do get in an array, right? You just say, uh, in an array list, you simply grab the, in, the element out of the values array. Someone asked a really good question, what does values look like under the hood? I gave you a quick sketch before. Look at, um, code it up and look at it in um, the Java Visualizer, it'll give you a better, better idea because um, the simplicity of the code on the screen doesn't necessarily reflect the simplicity under the hood, but I can tell you here that that is in fact very simple under the hood as well. Um, but it's messy to grow and contract, and you all saw that, right? So there we are, there's the growing and contracting craziness there. And in fact, look at what we did. We did not implement contraction. When we did remove, let's just write that in there as a comment. All right, so we're not contracting. When we remove something, we don't shrink the array. 
in our class implementation. To do this properly, you'd need to shrink it as well. And notice that's a good example where the test, we're not testing that in the test, the test won't even know how big the underlying array is. So that's a good example of where things can be not great in your implementation, but still passing the tests. All right, so a linked list, it's a logical fit to a list. Uh, it's easy to grow and contract, but if you've got a really big one and you want to go to the nth element, you've got to walk all the way through. And if you've got a million things, that could be intractable and completely unreasonable. Now, let me remind you of what a linked list is. Now, this thing I've drawn over here is a singly linked list, which means that each element in the node points to another element um, in the linked list. And notice something very interesting. This is a node. What does a linked list node have in it? It's got a value, which is what we often call the payload. That's the thing you're carrying around. In this case, it looks like a string, the letter A or the letter B. Um, and in the test example, it was a string. So that's the value. And then the other thing it has is a reference to another linked list node. So in this case, whoops. In this case, A is pointing to B. So that's a reference. Um, so this, this particular one has an A in it and a reference to B. This is what we call a recursive data type. We did recursion earlier, but we're talking about recursive algorithms. Here, notice this is a recursive data type because the data type LL node, linked list node, refers to linked list node. It's recursive. It refers to itself. And you can see this here. This type here, A, is of the same type as B. So A is referring to B. It's not referring to the same instance, A is not referring to A, but it's referring to something of the same type. So you've got the same type, your recursive data type here. Then the overall linked list has a start and end, okay, which, so there's a start and there's the end. So we've got a start and end, and you've got, in this particular case, you've got four of these things here, four linked list nodes. Each linked list node has a value in it, which in this case is A, that's B, that's C, that's D, and you've got an X pointer, which in this case goes like that, and the last one, D, points to nothing, which tells you it's the last one. All right, and a doubly linked list, by the way, has arrows pointing both directions. That has some nice properties. It's more flexible, but it also takes up more space and it's harder to maintain because you've got to now mess with two pointers every time instead of just one, okay? So there's an advantage in having a doubly linked list. This thing here is what we call a singly linked list and it's linked in one direction only. A doubly linked list would have arrows going back in the other direction as well. Okay, so link list reversal implementation. So one way to do is simply create a new list. Okay, that's a pretty simple way to do it. So let's, there's a list there. Reversal, the reason why I'm going here is because reversing a link list is often considered to be a tricky thing to do. It's not so hard, but let's just look at one way to do it. So we're gonna look at three different ways to do it. There's a new list way, which is the one on the left there. And um, one way to do that is just build up a new list, which goes B, uh, sorry, it goes D, C, B, and A, right? So you start off with a D, which is the, the far right one there. You peel that off the end, you say, okay, that's our new list. And then you go um, and peel off um, C, and then you peel off B, and then you peel off A, and then you've got yourself a new list. That's one way to do it. Pointer reversal is um, you simply flip the pointers around by grabbing hold of A and its next and its previous and, and flipping everything around like that. You can see that there. And then in the end, it looks like this, okay? So that's kind of, um, you can, in, in, the, in the middle step there, when we're doing C, that's like halfway through the process. You can see C is pointing both directions. You've got to be able to flip that thing around. So then you go to D, make D point to C and so forth. And you flip the start and the end in both cases. All right, so that's pretty interesting. Let me now show you recursive um, pointer rever uh, list reversal. Okay, recursive link list reversal. This, you, you've looked at recursive algorithms before. Now, let me remind you of what you need to do. You identify a base case, okay? And what would the base case be for a revert list reversal? You already suggested it in the tests. Someone suggested this in the tests. What's a base case for a list reversal? Can you put that in the chat? Maybe Leo can tell me if someone has a suggestion. What should there be the base case for a list reversal? I wanna reverse the order of a list. What's the simplest case here? Any case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, we can imagine that someone has already reversed some other part of the list. You got something, Leo? Uh, sorry, uh, just just said say it's an empty list, that is a base case. Uh, empty list of base case, there's actually a slightly better base case than that, than the empty list, that's a list of one, okay? List of one's also really trivial because um, if you reverse a list of one, it's still the same thing you started with. A bit like in merge sort, sorting a list of one is also easy, okay? So the base case I was looking for was the list of size one. If you re reverse a list of size one, you get the thing you started with, which is a really nice, easy base case. Okay, now what we can do is we can observe, so it's always when you do recursive things, you try and think what's the base case here which is really easy to deal with, it doesn't depend on anything else. Well, a list of size one is trivial, okay? It's already reversed, kind of obviously. 
Okay, and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, if we've got this list in front of us, let's imagine someone already did that. That's the other thing we have to do with the recursive algorithms. You have to suspend disbelief and imagine someone else has done work for you. So what we're gonna do is imagine someone has already reversed B, C, and D. So you, you're, you've got A, you're at A, and you say, imagine someone already reversed that. So you end up with D, C, and B, right? Someone's reversed that for you. If that's true, then how would you, if someone had told you that was possible, then how would you reverse it? Well, it turns out it's pretty easy if that's true, right? So now you've got a, if someone went and flipped that other list around like that, like I've just put on the screen there, so now D is the first of those other three and B is the last of those other three. So this is a reversal of B, C, and D. If that's true, what do you need to do? Well, you need to go to the last and put yourself there, okay? So we make the last refer to A like that. And then if you flatten the whole thing out, you end up with this, okay? So it's pretty obvious that if you could um, by magic, reverse those three things, then um, the, the three things to the right of A, then it's actually pretty easy. Okay, so the question is, can we do that? Well, the answer is, yeah, we can apply recursion. So let's look at those three things and see how we can reverse them. Okay, so we've got B, C, and D. We want to reverse those three things, okay? So we go there and we say, okay, so how do we reverse it? Well, let's start with B. And then just imagine we could reverse C and D, that is, reverse everything to the right of B, and how could we do that? Well, we just do this. Imagine we could somehow or other it got done. If that was already done, then all we need to do is the same as in the above. Make C refer to A uh, to B and um, turn um, B into the last, like that, okay? So now we've got ourselves a neat little um, list, which is the reversal of that list. And we continue this again, like that, and we end up with this. And we don't do the base case because the base case is obvious, and that is um, when you've just got one element. So if you want to reverse the, the list with just D in it, well, the reversal of D is D. Okay, so what you've seen there is a reversal, a recursive list reversal, which says that all we need to do is to reverse all the rest of the list uh, upstream of us. Okay, so now let's do the mini quiz. And we can get coding, and hopefully this time things are in better shape for us. So now we are going to create a new package here. Um, in fact, I think I can just do a copy. Uh, no, I can't. Let's create a new package. New um, package A02. There it is. And I will copy all this stuff across so you can see how it builds up, right? So if you want to go back to what we did first, you have to go back to A A01. Now I'm pasting all the stuff into A02, maybe. Don't tell me it's gonna break again. Nope, it's happy, all right, terrific. All right, so we'll get rid of this stuff. We'll close all these things away so we can um, be sure we're using the right version. And what we're gonna do is gonna change that test around. Let's go in here, list test, there it is. We're gonna change this around here and say that we're now gonna be testing the linked list rather than the array, so we're gonna say false here. Okay, false. Oops, false. Like that. Okay, so the, so now when we run the test, it will test the, the linked list, all right? Um, and here we go. So test this, and it should fail everything, all right? Because the linked list is unimplemented. Yep, and so it failed everything. All right, so what we want to do now is go and implement our linked list. All right, so there we are, there's our linked list. It's got no code in it. Um, the first thing we're gonna do is write ourselves a linked list node. Remember, remember in the example in the lecture slides here, uh, where are we? Back here, there. Okay, so there we had a linked list and it consisted of a start and an end which both referred to linked list nodes. So we're gonna do exactly that, okay? LL node, we're gonna create something just like that. Um, and we'll, we'll make, a, so we're gonna do that with a, um, a, uh, and in a class here, so class, class LL node, we'll call it that. And um, what's gonna be in the node? It's gonna have two things, each node has two things. What are the two things the linked list node has? It has its value, which is like the payload, we call that the payload sometimes, which is gonna be a type T, and it's gonna have a reference to the next LL node. Okay, so we're gonna have T, which is gonna be the value, and we're gonna have LL node, which is gonna be next, all right? And then we have gotta write some methods. And what we can write up, oops, what we can write up here is we can say um, the linked list data structure itself is gonna have 
references to the first and the last LL node. Okay, so we'll say LL node, node um, first, LL node last. And the other thing we of course need is the number of elements. Okay, so our linked list has a reference to the first node, a reference to the last node, <clears throat> and then each node has a, um, a value of type T and uh, a reference to its next node, okay? So now when we create a, um, a node, what we're gonna do is um, say this, we'll say um, public LL node, and we're gonna pass in a value and it's next, um, LL node next, like that, okay? And then, then we just say this dot value equals value and um, this dot next equals next. Like that, okay? Um, what else do we want? Oh, I know what we want. We want a two string method, okay? So we want to be able to print out each node in a way that is, um, actually we can make this, we can make this, um, Yeah, what we can do is we can make this recursive itself. So the LL node can print out not only itself, but everything that's that's next of it, right? So you can say this, you can say at override, override um, uh, public string, to string. And so we can write a recursive method that prints our value out and everything upstream. And so what we can do is say string RTN equals, <clears throat> um, now we have to do this, so it's gonna be the value, plus whatever's upstream. Now, if there's nothing upstream, then we just return that, okay? But if there is something upstream, then we add a space and return whatever is upstream. So we say if um, next is not equal to null, then we're gonna, our return value, RTN, plus equals a space, followed by whatever's up next, okay? and. Next is, of course, of type LL node, which call its two string method, which will do, you know, so then it recurs. Okay, and finally, we're gonna say return RTN. Okay, then, so now we have a, um, so now what we wanna do is you also wanna write a two string method for this whole class. So we'll say at override um, public void string, Yep, string, uh, public void, no, no, public string, two string, like that. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, well, I think all we need to do is just say um, return return first, right? Oh, um, unless first is null, of course. So, um, so we'll say uh, if first equals null, so there's nothing in this linked list, then we'd return that, right, nothing else return first or first or two string or yeah if we, could, if we do this that forces it to do a two string operation it says empty string plus whatever's coming so then it's, it forces first into being a, two, a, a string otherwise you could do the following the other way to do it would be this like that. that that also works but we can just do this that's a pattern that we've used before either way is fine <clears throat> and if we do both then it just grays one of them out because it's unnecessary Okay, so now what we have is a linked list node. We've got a first and a last, and we've got um, a two string method. So I guess the first thing to do is to add um, something. So we have, I think that's what we wanna do next. That's what I had in my plan here. Yeah, so let's go and add something to our linked list. <clears throat> um, now to add something, what do we need to do first? We need to check if, um, well, if to add something, we're definitely gonna create a new, new node, right? So we can, we can do that. Um, Link list node, LLN equals new LL node uh, value. And um, what's, go what's gonna be its next? It's gonna be whatever is currently first, which could be null, but it'll be whatever's currently first. That's whatever's gonna be next of this thing we just created, right? Um, or oh, actually, no, if we're gonna put it on the end, um, yeah, if we put it on the end, then, sorry, let's just put it on the end of the list. So we add this thing to the end, so we'll say null. Okay, so the thing we're creating will point to null because it's gonna be on the end of the list. Okay, so um, add to end of list, like that, okay? 
So uh, whatever we have, whatever's next to this is nothing. And then we say if there's two situations now, if there is no list here at all, it means the first is null, then we just say this, we say if first equals null, it means we haven't got anything in this list yet. Then we'll say first is equal to um, LLN, but that's also last. So you can actually write this in Java. You can say first and last are both equal to LLN. So you're initializing the first and the last to point to the thing we just created, okay? <clears throat> Otherwise, there is a first, means that there, there, there is actually a list here. And so now what we want to do is just say, the, the, go to the last thing in the list, make its next point to LLN, and um, then make last be equal to LLN. So um, last.next is equal to the thing we just created, like that. Um, and then we just say last is the thing we just created. Like that. Okay, so two cases. One, the first case here is when there is nothing in this in this uh, linked list, in which case we make the first and the last point of the thing we just made. Else there is something which we, in which case we add it to the end by making the next pointer of the last point of the thing we just created and set last to point to LL. Um, now, I think we might better pass the test at this stage. Let's see what we got here. See if add will work. <clears throat> add should work because it doesn't depend on get. So let's see if it works. It did not work. All right, what have we messed up? Let's have a look here. What's the matter with it? With it? Okay, so test add failed. Here, let's just click on this and see what happened. Oh, what have I, what have I forgotten to do, folks? Um, I bet I forgot to add to increase the size, right? So it says here that the size is supposed to be one. It failed on that. So my, my guess is I just forgot to add that, yeah. We didn't add that, so we're going to say elements, elements plus plus, right? So now let's run that. Oops, rerun the test. So we, we added an element to the list, so of course we have to increment the number of elements. That wasn't our only problem, apparently. Uh, what's our problem now? Oop, we still got a problem. Okay, so l.add. Um, so, so the size is zero. Then we're going to add a, and it expects the size to be one. Well, it should be one. What have we gotten wrong here? Oh, here's the problem. Can, you, can anyone see the problem now? It's right in the screen, right in front of us. I didn't implement this. So when it gets a size, it keeps returning zero, whatever the size is. All right, so we, there are two things we didn't do. A, we had to increment it, but also we had to return it, right? So now let's run it. <clears throat> Terrific, we've passed the add test. All right, so now what we're gonna do is do the remove test. Um, and actually, what about get? Yeah, let's do get first. Yeah, let's do get because um, get will be helpful in remove, I think, uh, maybe. Um, so what we want to do is we want to get a particular element. And so what we're going to do is write a recursive thing for getting a particular linked list element at that indice, okay? So um, how would we do that? Well, if I want to um, get a linked list node, which is linked list element zero, then that's me because I'm the front of the list. If it's one, then I ask my neighbor to give me the linked list element zero, and they say, oh, that's me, and they give, it, they give it back. So what we can do is we can express it in terms of how far down the list we want to go relative to the front of the list, and each time we recurse, we just reduce by one because we're taking one step further in the list. Hopefully that made sense. If it didn't, let's, let's write the code here. Private, um, what we want to do here, what, what's kind of handy is if we hand back the node, not just the value, but the node, because that will help us with other things later on. So let's say private um, LL node, um, get um, uh, ll node like that, and then pass it the index, um, int index, right? Um, oh, and the start. So relative to a particular starting point, right? Okay, so um, now if, th this turns out to be simple, right? Because if the index is zero, then we just return start, right? So we say if index, equals zero, return start, start, right? So this is ourselves, else we return get LL node of index minus one 
and start dot next uh, dot next okay so uh, that should be a comma and that should be a semicolon at the end there okay so um, <clears throat> if someone says give me the zero element of your linked list then that means the first element that means me the start if they say give me the first that means it's actually the zeroth of my neighbor so I can just say start dot next and give me um, index minus one hopefully that makes made sense to you um, so now we have a thing which gets me a particular node at a given index right f uh, relative to some particular start so now when they say get what we can do is we can say um, we can grab that node we can just say um, return get ll node from the first in the whole list followed by the index and then we and that returns a node and we take the value from it okay like that so that should give us the get hopefully it makes sense so this thing here will, will find the node at that index and this thing here will take that node and then then give us the value that's held by that node let's run this and if with a bit of luck we will have um, get working <clears throat> After that, we can move on to um, remove. Yep, we got get working. So now let's go to remove. Um, now remember, the one, we've got to do two things here. First of all, we have to um, return the thing that was at that value. That's part of what remove wants us to do. So we have to go to that value and find it. But also, what we need to do is we need to remove the node itself from the list. But think about it, if we want to remove this element from the list, we need to know what was before it in the list so we can fix its pointer to jump over it, okay? So what we really want to do is to get the previous one to this one, okay? So if we want to remove this one, we really want to find the one before it so that we can step over it, okay? So, but what happens if the one we want to remove is the very first one in the whole list? In that case, we have to deal with that as a special case, and that's actually pretty easy to deal with. So let's just deal with the two cases separately. So we'll say, um, if, if index equals zero, that's a special case. And it's actually easy. If you want to take the first thing off the list, then that's not so hard, right? Um, and let's just do the following. We'll say, oops, don't do that. Um, LL node, um, oh, sorry, no, no, it should be of type T, RTN. So if they want to take the first one off the list, then we'll just say um, <clears throat> uh, RTN equals first dot um, value. Now here we're assuming that they're indexing correctly. Like if they index the wrong one, like they indexed off the start of the list or off the end of the list, that would create an error and we're not dealing with errors yet. We're going to do, do that really soon. In a couple of lectures time, we're going to do error handling in JUnit and we're going to actually come back to this very code and add in the error handling. But for the moment, we're just going to assume that they're correctly indexing. All right. So, um, so if they've asked for index zero, then we have to assume there is at least one element here and then we're going to return first dot value. So, um, and then <clears throat> What we need to do is we need to make fix up first. We say first equals first dot next. We're going to skip over it, right? And um, if the next thing from first, if there's only one element in the list, then we need to um, um, make last and first both be equal to null, right? So we say if first equals null, means that there's nothing else there, then last equals null also. Now, at the end here, we're going to have to re remove elements minus minus and return RTN like that. And all right, so we've done that. We've done the case where they're asking for the first element in the list. Otherwise, they're asking for something else. Um, so now let's deal with the other case. <clears throat> what we want to do now, we know it's not the first one. So what we can do is grab the prior to the one they want. So if they're asking for one, then we get zero. If they're asking for five, we get four. And that gets us the one before they want to remove. So we'll call it this. We'll say LL node um, prior, prior being the one before they want, that they want to remove, equals get um, LL node first and then index minus one. This is the list node before the one to remove. Okay, like that. 
And then what we want to do um, is the, the one that we actually want is our target. We'll say LL node target equals prior dot um, next. Okay, so that's the actual one we want, want to do. And we'll say RTN, the thing we have to return is going to be target's value, right? Target dot value. Yep, like that. And then we do the same sort of logic as above. We're going to say that the we have to step over it now. So we're going to have to say priors next is going to be equal to targets next. So prior dot next equals target dot next. Um, and what else? And then oh, then we just have to check whether the target was the last one. If we're removing the last one in the list, we we better fix up last. Okay. So we now we we'll say if last equals target then we'll, we better fix up last and say last equals prior. Okay, so if the, if the one we're pulling was the last one on the list, we have fixed it up. And with a bit of luck, that's got remove working. So let's just test that. And we may just have time here to do the recursive. Yeah, we've got remove. So let's try and do a reversal, which would be really sweet because it means we finished this entire, sec this entire chunk in one big hit, even with our crazy um, little issue there. So let's do reversal now, because reversal sounds tricky, but it's not actually so tricky. Um, and we'll go quickly back to this to the PowerPoint so you can remember how it worked. Right, okay, so the whole idea was, if we want to reverse the whole list, then we'd start with A and say, hey, if you would just reverse everything upstream of A, bang like that, so now you reverse B, C, D, then I can fix up my list by going like this. Right, and then flattening it and you get that there, okay? So that assumes you can somehow or other reverse everything upstream of it, okay? And then it's just some fairly minor manipulation to get it right. So let's follow that approach. Um, so what we're gonna do though, is we're gonna write our own little private method here. Oops, um, private, um, we'll call it um, uh, recursive reversal. and we'll pass in the old first. That means the thing that was previously the first, like in that example, it would have been A. So we'll say um, LL node um, old first, okay? And then we're gonna say that if the old first has um, points, the next thing after, the, after, the, the, after this is nothing, then it's a single element list, right? So there's nothing to be done. So if old first dot next equals null, then we've got a single element list. Um, then we say, uh, what do we do? We re return old first, right? So there's nothing to be done. Otherwise, there is something upstream of it, in which case what we want to do is um, we're going to uh, do a reversal of everything upstream of it. So the way we do that, um, we can say that the um, new prior, that, that's the thing that, let's go back to this again. Okay, so the prior to A, in this case here, the new prior to A will be B, right? So when everything's finished, the prior to A is B. The thing before A is B. So the new prior in this case is B, which is the, the last um, thing in the, um, which is actually the next thing after A initially, or the last thing after it's been resorted, okay? So what we'll do is we'll say the new prior is equal to A's next, or old first is next, okay? Old first dot next, okay? So the thing that's next of where we are will become the thing that's before us afterwards, okay? And then what we're gonna say is that the, um, the first will be equal to um, what happens when we, when we sort that remaining list. Call it new first if you want, new first equals um, recursive reversal of the new prior. That is, okay, so that means here. So if we do a recursive reversal of that, we end up with D, which is gonna be the new first, okay? <clears throat> That's the new first. Then what we can do is we can say um, the new prior, prior um, dot next, that's like B is gonna, gonna point to A, right? So that's gonna equal to old first, right? And we're gonna return whatever the new first is. So return the new first, like that. Okay, so that should implement what you just saw in the PowerPoint. Now, 
if it does, then the, to reverse the list is not so hard. Um, so we say if um, the first is not equal to null, if the first is equal to null, then there's nothing to be done, right? So, but if it's not equal to null, if it's not equal to null, then you're going to say something like this. You're going to say last is equal to the first, and um, <clears throat> first is equal to the recursive reversal of um, of last. It equals recursive reversal of last. Oh, sorry, of first, which is the same thing. Okay, but just to be clear, it's it's the first that you want to you want to recurs a reversal on a, for example, in in the example on the PowerPoint. So now you fixed up last to point to that, and first points to that, and then finally you have to terminate the list after you've done all that stuff. You go back to the PowerPoint. You've got to make sure that that a now points to its next is nothing. Uh, previously it was pointing to b. You want to fix that up. Okay, so you, we have to make a point to nothing. So you say now first dot next equals null. Right, is that it? I think it is. Let's just run it. Oop, it did not work. What have I done wrong? Let's just see what the error message says. Okay, so it's got it in the, okay, we, hmm. Okay, so it returned just the last element, not the reversal of it all. Okay, so we, we expected, or it's possible our test is wrong too, don't forget that. So let's just check this out. So A, B, B, C, C. Um, let's just put a test in here. It's possible that um, the error is here. So let's just put it, let's just, oops. Let's just put a test here, make sure it's coming out the right way. So it should be C, C, C. B, B, A. Let's see if it fails there and see what it actually what actually happens here. And what did it do? Okay, so it expected to get CC and it's still only, okay, so it's only returning the last element. So that suggests that we're not fixing up the last thing to point back to the first thing. So where did I do that wrong? Let me have a look here. Um, the new first, ooh, new first, we have to make sure that points to, what have I done wrong here? Ah, last.next equals null. Yes, of course. <laughs> you see what I just did then? It, I, this was the error. I had first.next equals null, and what I meant to write here is last.next equals null. So I was, I was destroying the list. So let's just try this. Okay, try it again. I, I, what, I, what, I had oops, what I had intended to do there was to say that the end of the list must have a null in it, but I accidentally said the, first, the start of the list must have a null in it, which of course destroyed the list. All right, there we are, folks. We have got it working, meaning that we've passed our tests. We wrote quite a few tests, but um, they weren't perfect. Um, so what you have now is we've just today done two complete implementations of, 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 of the list abstract data type. We've got a linked list. We've got an array list. You saw recursive list reversal. Now let's finish up with two bios. We skipped a bio last week. Um, let's just do two quick bios. They're really interesting ones. First is John McCarthy. You should have heard of this guy. If you haven't, he's another person you really need to know about because he invented garbage collection. Actually, that's not the reason why you need to know about him. You need to know about him because he's, he's often regarded as the father of AI, the father of AI. And in doing so, he invented the language Lisp and he invented a whole lot of stuff which is really aimed at doing what he thought needed to happen in order for us to have AI. So he's very much regarded as the father of AI and he of course won the Turing Award very early on. He's one of the early Turing Award winners and he's certainly an absolute titan of computer science. Um, and what, what else do you know him from? But anyway, there, there you go. There, there's a bit of a bio of him and he's certainly worth knowing given how important AI is to the, well literally the planet today. Um, a, a lot goes back to McCarthy. All right, the next person I want to highlight is Barbara Liskov. Uh, Barbara w uh, won the Turing Award in 2008. She is one of the people who's responsible for many of the key concepts that underpin object-oriented programming. Um, and uh, she also has a nice thread of heritage which runs right to 
ANU Computer Science. Um, my colleague and friend Tony Hosking is the Director of Computer Science. He, his advisor was Elliot Moss, who comes to visit us at ANU nearly every year, except when there's a pandemic on. And Elliot was a student of Barbara. Um, Barbara did a whole lot of amazing stuff with the distributed systems. She also worked in garbage collection and also worked with, um, but most importantly, worked with the key ideas behind object orientation. I've told you about state and behavior as being key concepts. Those are some of the key ideas that, uh, that, that came out of the work that Barbara and her group at MIT did. With that, um, we've come to the end of the lecture. We're pretty much right on time. Um, have a great week. If you have any questions, please um, ask them on PR.